Discussions in Depth Psychology is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. Your host is Bonnie Bright. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Discussions in Depth Psychology, which is powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I also earned my PhD from Pacifica in the Depth Psychology program there. And this interview series is dedicated to introducing you to some of the amazing individuals who are contributing so much to this important field. And today, I'm really happy to be speaking with Kieran McGrice who is a professor of depth psychology and also the chair of Union and Archetypal Studies at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara. Kieran, thanks so much for being with me. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I'm really glad that you're here, and I've heard your name, of course, in many of the Pacifica circles, but also in the wider depth psychology community. It's really exciting to know that you have recently, very recently, written a new book, which is just coming out, and we'll be talking about that a bit. But we'll also be talking about some of the really exciting findings that you have observed over your career in mythology and depth psychology. And so let's go ahead and jump right in. But first, before we do that, I'm going to read your bio, Karen, for everybody so that we can establish a little bit better who you are. And then we'll go forward. So Kieran LeGrice is a professor of depth psychology and the chair of the Union and Archetypal Studies program at Pacifica Graduate Institute, which I mentioned earlier. He also teaches courses there on archetypes, alchemy, synchronicity, and the history of depth psychology. And Kieran was educated at the University of Leeds in England where he received a BA Honors in Philosophy and Psychology, and also at the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIIS, in San Francisco, where he received his MA and his PhD in Philosophy and Religion. And Kieran is the founding editor of Archi, the Journal of Archetypal Cosmology, and he's the author of four books, The Archetypal Cosmos, Discovering Eris, and The Rebirth of the Hero, and then recently, of course, as I mentioned, he published Archetypal Reflections, Insights, and Ideas from Union Psychology. Kieran has also taught for Groff Transpersonal Training in the UK and is the commissioning editor for Muswell Hill Press in London. So, Kieran, wow, that's a, a very interesting, at least to me, biography, because I see so many things that I'm interested in there, and I think that most of our listeners probably are as well. And I've also done a lot of the Groff transpersonal training work, so maybe that will come up in the conversation as we get going. But I'd love to hear your story about how you got involved in the field of union and depth psychologies, because, first of all, it's not something that I think most people sort of set out to be as a, a child to to get involved in this kind of practice. I know it took me until I was really in my late 30s before I even discovered the field of depth psychology. I had never really read much of Jung. And so I'm really fascinated to hear people's journeys coming to this kind of work because it's such a unique field. So can you share a little bit about your story and what led you here? Sure. Well, thank you, first of all, for reading the bio and getting through all those details. Yeah, I'd be happy to talk about my, my background and how I first got into the study of Jung. I actually was quite early. It was quite early for me. I was in my late teens. I got into spirituality generally kind of, uh, I suppose, in a slightly new age way. I was reading a lot of stuff that was popular at the time. M. Scott Peck and Paramahansa Yogananda, the autobiography of a yogi, was very, very popular at that time. And I also, uh, at the same age, got into astrology. I had an interest in that field. I learned, I taught myself how to draw astrological charts, and I read everything I could on astrology. And it was kind of in that context that I came across young and I was also uh, undergrad at the university I was studying philosophy and psychology and I, I guess I was a little disappointed in that the mainstream dominant approach to psychology especially in academia really bypassed young so I was reading young in my spare time I remember I was 19 20 and I, I, I think I read pretty much the whole of the collected works at that time uh, but none of that featured at all in my formal study at Leeds. But still, there was enough you know, overlap in my interest to satisfy me. So that's really when I got into Young. Also, Joseph Campbell, around the same time, I saw the Power of Myth interview with Bill Moyers. And all that was, was very influential on me. I remember being particularly impressed with Young's two essays on analytical psychology, which he wrote mostly in the 1920s, right in the middle of his career. And a central focus of that book is the role of archetypes in individuation. Um, both those concepts were especially compelling to me at that age. You know, 
I felt, I think like many people who get into Jung, that I had an intuitive grasp of what these concepts meant and they really gripped me. You know, it felt like I was tapping into a deep current in my life, my passion, my bliss, as Campbell would say. Um, so that, that was the, the real beginning. And I didn't embark on, on a formal career in dub psychology until, well, I guess it would have been my late 20s was something of a turning point. Earlier in my 20s, I kind of had a, a more regular life, I guess. I, I worked in computing, a computer programmer, and then um, uh, in, in my late 20s, I felt compelled to try to formulate for myself what my world view was at the time. And, and I had these various aspects, astrology, Young, Campbell, and more. So I tried to put all that together, and in the end, it evolved into a book eventually became The Archetypal Cosmos, it was published in 2010. Uh, so I'd written the first draft of that book, and I really wanted it to make that psychology and, and related areas my life, my career. So I began graduate studies. I moved from the UK to San Francisco, and I began studying there at the California Institute of Integral Studies, as you mentioned. Richard Tarnas was there, Stanislav Groff, and a number of other Jungian-informed professors. So uh, I studied uh, in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program there, and it was a real multidimensional, wide-ranging exposure to many new paradigm ideas as well as Jungian psychology and philosophy. Uh, so th it was there I really had the chance to refine my manuscript, which became the Archetypal Cosmos. So that was my formal beginning academically in a career in depth psychology. And then I began teaching for Pacifica in 2012. Uh, I was lucky enough to be invited by the then chair, Jennifer Selig, to teach a course on archetypes. So I, I began that in 2012. And then in 2013, I became core faculty in the Jungian and Archetypal Studies program at Pacifica. And I'm in a very uh, the enviable position. I, I know I've been able to teach these wonderful subjects there, archetypes, alchemy, synchronicity are the three courses that I ordinarily teach. So really it's a, something of a dream come true to, to be in this position, having been on that long journey over many years. Well, I have to say, Kieran, it's so interesting to hear you sort of outline your journey through that. And I mean, for me, I experience a little bit of envy knowing how early exactly you, you began your studies and that you sort of happened onto this world because Again, as I mentioned, mine was really sort of in that typical kind of midlife yeah. time frame that Jung talks about when, when you really start looking for yourself and you find. And I think it wasn't that I wasn't looking before. It's just that I hadn't found this particular track. I mean, the works of Jung and depth psychology, it just changed my life so radically when I did just happen upon it and discover it. And so uh, I, I sort of have been on the fast track, I think, since then. And so it's just a very different way of approaching it. But there's definitely some benefit to having – some of these understandings, I think, as a young person and, and even through your 20s when you're really sort of developing your identity as a person in the world and trying to understand what's going on around you. So that's just such a lovely thought that you had discovered that personally. And also, you know, I see a lot of young people, I feel, who are sort of discovering depth psychology and, and beginning to pursue an education in it and graduate degrees in things like Jungian and archetypal studies. And so it's very encouraging for me because I believe that it, it provides such tremendous guidelines, particularly for today's crises that we're experiencing on so many different levels in our society, our culture. I, mean, I, I think there's a right moment for everyone to find their way in the field, everyone who's predisposed to do that. I mean, for me, there, there was an advantage and a disadvantage to getting into this stuff quite early. So I felt in my 20s, it was something of an impediment to participating in the world to, to a certain extent because I, I had this deep interest in, in the depths of the psyche and spirituality and I found that at a certain point at least that was pulling me away from the world. I actually made a conscious decision to put everything to one side in my 20s and try to live a more regular life and build my ego, to, to put it in, in Jungian terms, to kind of build a, a more stable identity. And then when I began in earnest to really get involved in the field later on as a more mature adult. I, you know, I was certainly able to draw on my early exposure to this, but it was in a different way. I think my earlier grasp of young and related ideas was, as I said, a kind of intuitive 
recognition or, or a revelation of these ideas. And, and later on, it, I think I, I gained more first-hand experience of the psyche. And it was certainly helpful then to have these frameworks in the back of my mind to know of individuation, for example, and, and that and that's Jung's model of, of psychological development and transformation. To have that in mind was really very helpful to me when I began to deepen into my own psychological process in, in my late 20s and early 30s. I went through something of a, a crisis of transition at that time, you know, perhaps not unlike yours uh, in your 30s. And at that point, you know, I found it a great benefit to be able to call to mind these ideas, you know, Jung's ideas of the self and archetypes and individuation. So I was very grateful to have that early exposure. Yeah, I think it's so beneficial, but I really appreciate the way that you're describing it. And I understand what you're saying about how it can pull you kind of into a different world. And it's, it is good to have your feet really grounded firmly into the world at hand. And so I certainly appreciate that. And yet the word that keeps kind of coming to mind as I hear you sharing that story is refinement. And I suppose we all go through that. It's kind of an alchemical process, that refining. And each time some of these things come around, you know, it just gets us more and more in tune or in touch with the true self, really, I guess. And Yeah, uh, yeah. And I think refinement and, you know, maybe discernment as well is, is, an, is another word. I mean, part of the challenge for me, having encountered these ideas and early in my life, and I, and I had some quite profound spiritual experiences in my late teens and early 20s as well, and it it takes quite a lot to assimilate those experiences and that new knowledge and integrate them into a rounded, balanced existence. So it took me quite a while, really, for that to happen, to feel I was solid ground in my relation to Jungian ideas and, and spiritual experiences. So that definitely came later. And, and that was through becoming more discerning about which ideas were really valuable to me and relevant to my life and which ideas were less significant or perhaps even deleterious to me in some sense. So, yeah, refinement and discernment are absolutely essential in dealing with what are uh, profoundly transformative ideas. Mm, I really like those words, too. And and so critical, I think, at every stage in our life. And speaking of that, you've done such a, a really appropriate job of articulating how this inspired you, how you intuitively grasp some of the understandings. But can you say a little bit more, because of your role now as the chair of the Union Archetypal Studies Program, I suppose students that come to Pacifica who are looking for that, they probably already have an idea of how having an archetypal or mythological lens can change their own lives or how they can utilize that or employ it. But how would you go about explaining that to somebody who doesn't really have that understanding yet? Or what do you see as the value of having that possibility of using an archetypal or mythological lens in everybody's life? Well, they're great questions. I'll need to give a kind of multifaceted answer to this. There's not one simple answer, but I think an archetypal view, for those listeners that don't know Jung, one of Jung's main concepts was that of the archetype, and he basically put forward what we might call a pluralistic or polytheistic is a word that's sometimes used, a, a pluralistic view of the nature of human experience. So generally we think of ourselves in a singular way as, as having a single self, a single identity. And Jung realized that the human personality, the human psyche is not just comprised of, of that single identity, the I principle, but that there are multiple senses or archetypes that shape who we are. And each of the archetypes, in some sense, is like a sub-personality with its own aims, its own moods, its own ideas. And so he developed this pluralistic model of the psyche. So I think applying those ideas to one's own experience, we can begin to what is often referred to as differentiate the psyche. We can distinguish between the different impulses that are moving us from one day to the next and learn to recognize these sub-personalities as they present themselves to our awareness. Because often we can give expression to these sub-personalities unconsciously, and that can not always be the best thing. I mean, the explicit aim of that psychology, or one of the aims, is to make the unconscious conscious. Through self-knowledge, through a, a deep knowledge of the psyche, come to better recognize the unconscious motivations and impulses and drives and instincts that move us all the time. So Jungian psychology is an entrance point into that 
way of being in the world, of recognizing that what we generally take to be our personality, which you can call the ego, is but one of a multiplicity of different principles that are, are working through us. So individuation, which is another of Jung's central ideas, is the process by which we can come to terms with this psychological multiplicity and in time attuned to what Jung called the self, which has a different meaning to what we normally assign to that word. You know, normally we say self, we mean in that psychological parlance, the ego. But the self for Jung, and it's often written with a capital S, really refers to something far greater than the human ego. He describes it as the incarnate God image. So it's, it's like the deepest self is like, in some sense, like the God within. So to recognize the self and the, the impulses and dictates of the self is in a way like aligning oneself with God's will or to put it another way like recognizing the Tao and attuning to the Tao of things so it's a greater authority than one's own personal will beyond reason beyond rationality it's like a transrational center that is a center not only of our consciousness and our ordinary personality but for the whole psyche consciousness and the unconscious so I think an archetypal Jungian perspective is very helpful in, in that differentiation in recognizing the multiple centers that move us. So hand in hand with that, then, there's the idea that an archetypal or symbolic way of viewing one's experience can enable us to find deep meaning in life. I mean, collectively, we, we find ourselves increasingly living in a very secular world where you know, we no longer, of course, recognize gods and goddesses as the ancient Greeks did. And for many people, Christianity no longer has the spiritual sustenance that it once did. It doesn't speak to us in a, in a vital manner anymore. God is dead, as Nietzsche declared at the end of the 19th century. So we live in a time where there's no obvious and immediately accessible mythological or religious framework that we can attune to to give us orientation in our lives to provide the meaning for our existence so depth psychology young in depth psychology enables one in some way to turn within and through the exploration of the unconscious through the study of dreams or synchronicities meaningful coincidences that happen in our lives and through direct encounters with the unconscious and spiritual experiences, we can begin to find our own sense of meaning, even within the secular environment that we live in. We can attune to the archetypes, we can attune to the self, and that can bring us into contact with a source of what Jung called the numinous, as a term he borrowed from Rudolf Otto. The numinous is the mysterium tremendum et fascinans, the tremendous and fascinating mystery that underlies our existence uh, and the unconscious dimension of the psyche for Jung is in touch with that numinous power. So Jung believes, and I agree, that, that if one can have a direct experience of the numinous, it can help ground us in our own spiritual and moral autonomy so that religion then is no longer a matter of faith, as it has been in Christianity, of course, but, but a matter of experience. So that's uh, another way that Jungian in-depth psychology can help us, I think, to, you know, to find our own personal myth, or as Jung put it, our, our individual myth, in a time when the collective myths are often rendered invalid or rejected and debunked by dominant scientific rational perspective. So there are other things I could say, but that, for me, they are two important gifts of Jungian in-depth psychology in our historical moment, that it empowers the individual to find his or her own way into some kind of spiritual, mythic, symbolic mode of being in the world. And that can counter a sense of existential meaninglessness, which can, can manifest in psychopathology and all manner of ills, both individually and collectively. Oh, it's so fascinating. You know, I'm struck, Karen, as I hear you talk, probably for the 10,000th time when I think about depth psychology, that it has a, almost an element of magic about it. And, and I don't mean that in terms of magical thinking, but almost in terms of just how powerful it is to be able to know and understand some of these things. And not only about ourselves, which, of course, you mentioned we're all trying to make meaning, and, and it really does give us a framework and some tools to be able to really find very deep meaning in our own 
lives by finding our personal myths, by finding and identifying those archetypes that are driving our lives, those unconscious forces that we're very much susceptible to, even whether we know it or not. But it also helps us in times of difficulties that we're seeing in our culture, divisiveness and difficulties to be able to start identifying the archetypes that are really at work in our culture today and things that are driving us to various activities and actions that may or may not be beneficial to the collective. Yeah. Could I just say one thing in response to that? Because I think it's a, you know, it's a very important point that you raise. You know, if you just look around at the, at the news stories day to day, they're just truly horrific. We had that terrible atrocity in Nice and you know, these are not isolated incidents, but they, they seem to be in you know, every week. There's, there's something like that e- even every day. Mm. And I think Jung was concerned with that the human being is needed to come to terms with the darker side of the psyche and, and he even put it in terms of the, the kind of dark, destructive power of the unconscious God or spirit. If you read Jung's answer to Job, he addresses that. We see the energy of this, this dark, spiritual power manifested in so many destructive ways. I just feel that it's you know, the responsibility of us who know of young, Jungian ideas and their psychology to help individuals and perhaps the wider culture have a greater recognition of the potential of energies that have not been brought into conscious awareness to manifest in potentially destructive ways. Because I think one of the benefits of trying to attune to the self or, you know, as Joseph Campbell would say, of trying to pour all one's life, all one's passion into following one's bliss, you know, Campbell's term, if you follow your bliss, that can kind of draw all the energies of life into a focus on the service of the self. And I'm reminded, as I say this, of a, a Logian in the Gospel of Thomas that basically says that if you bring forth what is deep within you, it will save you. But if you do not bring that forth, what is within you will destroy you. And I think we see some of that destructive energy, that destructive instinctual and a kind of primitive emotional energy that's really surfacing in our time. So the more we can be aware of that energy and the more we can channel it to constructive ends in service of the deep psyche, then I think the better it will be for all of us. Yes, so true. And of course, that reminds me of what Jung said, too, about if we don't make the things that are unconscious conscious, that they will happen outside of us as fate. So those things are going to come to the surface and act themselves out in the world around us if we're not aware of them and, and actively, I think, working on them in order to come into some kind of relationship with them so that they aren't just kind of running amok as you, you know, you mentioned these dark energies and they, they are energies and they are at work. And I do think that we all have that capacity to be able to bring some of that back into balance if we're willing to do that work on ourselves. And sometimes that's just a question of holding that space. And, you know, I at one point had hoped to be able to make a commentary on some of these giant crises that have been emerging in the past couple of years, particularly in the form of a blog or something. But there's just so many of them. I kind of found myself just so overwhelmed, like I'm sure most of us are, and unable to really even just outwardly or extrovertedly address each one as they come along. But there is some benefit, I think, to being able to just hold that space. And again, I think that's part of the work of trying to employ the archetypal forces that work in our own lives that echo out into the culture. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the pace of change is just phenomenal at the moment. And, you know, I hear you when you say you, you just don't have the the psychological resources or even the, the practical ends to keep up with the news stories as they break and to put them into some kind of written format. I mean, it's just incessant at the moment. I think, you know, a challenge of our time it, it, for those of us involved in depth psychology is to try to find a way to communicate the ideas of depth psychology to a new audience. And part of that is reaching out through social media and technology, but, but doing so in a way that the ideas themselves are not rendered superficial, but we can somehow be able to convey the depth and the integrity of the ideas, but through this very different medium. And I think that's something we're still working out. And uh, I think your mm-hmm. your organization, the Dub Psychology Alliance and Pacifica Graduate Institute, where I work, uh, where you studied, are both really at the forefront of that. We're, we're connecting people all over the world, in some cases, 
and bringing them into community. Like I'm thinking now of Teilhard de Chardin's idea of the noosphere. It's like this noosphere, this this mm-hmm. web, this uh, interconnected web that is drawing people together all over the planet and helping them connect, not in a superficial way, but from their own inner depths, from the depths of one center to the depths of another center. And I think that work is is so valuable. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of people who are really working toward that and continuing to contribute and to spin that web, to weave that web. So it's lovely to view it, and sometimes I feel like it can't happen fast enough. (laughs) But speaking of writing about this kind of thing, Karen, I wonder if you would just spend a minute and tell us a little bit about your new book, where you have obviously put some of these thoughts and insights into writing. Your new book is Archetypal Reflections, Insights and Ideas from Jungian Psychology. So, I mean, I'm sure that can include a lot of different things, but I love to hear a little bit about what that encompasses. Sure, sure. Well, well, actually, this book came out of my teaching at Pacifica. The program I'm involved in is the Jungian and Archetypal Studies program is what is known as a hybrid program. So it's partly residential, where the students come four times a year for residential sessions on campus, and it's partly online. So we have online modules in every course where students come online and respond to assignments set by the instructor listen to an audio lecture and do readings and then the instructor gets involved in responding to student discussion posts. So Archetypal Reflections actually is a compilation of my discussion posts over about a two or three year period across a number of courses. I found that I was mostly fully occupied with the work of being a faculty member at Pacifica and then being chair of the program. And I didn't really have a lot of time for other writing because I was doing that. And I was actually writing a lot online each week. So it seemed to me a good idea to draw on what I'd written on the discussion boards and to try to organize that into broad themes and present that in book form in the hope that a wider audience might also benefit from some of the ideas that are under discussion. So I was lucky enough to be able to do that. I went through each of my courses and compiled my responses organize them into themes, and the result is archetypal reflection. So in a sense, the book was not something I intended to write. It was kind of an accident, but it just came to me one day that this could be a useful book to have out there, particularly because so many of my written responses to students were in response to their questions and reflections. So really, the students in the classes elicited my own thoughts and prompted me to address topics that I might not otherwise have considered if it weren't for their questions. So uh, the students had a, had a big hand in this book in many ways, although it's all, all my own posts, of course. But uh, So really it's a book that in some sense illustrates what the Jungian and Archetypal Studies program is about and the kind of topics that we get onto. So just to give you a little flavor of what's in there, there's an introduction to depth psychology section where I do a number of contrasts between Freud and Jung, and then there are dedicated sections on archetypes, the individuation process, and and out of the course I teach on synchronicity, there are a lot of reflections on that particular topic. Synchronicity for Jung was what we might popularly refer to as signs. You know, when you're trying to think, what should I do with my life, and you ask for a sign or, or a symbol, Jung called these meaningful coincidences where the outer world seems to mirror what we're contemplating inwardly in an uncanny and often luminous uh, juxtaposition of inner and outer. So there are quite a lot of reflections on synchronicity and offshoots of that, uh, the mind-matter relationship. I reflect more broadly on the Western worldview, the evolution of consciousness. So it's quite a varied book in terms of content, yet everything is centered on Jungian and, and archetypal psychology. So it gave me the chance, this book, to write in a different style because my other books, I've written three books before this one, are mostly big theses. The book needs to be read as a whole, whereas in Archetypal Reflections, the book is comprised of these short, concise, paragraph-length responses and, and thoughts. And so I thought sometimes it's easier to read a short passage and uh, to assimilate a, an insight that's in a short passage rather than reading a long thesis. So I hope that because of the different format, the different medium, that readers of this book might get value from the ideas that are discussed there. Yeah, it sounds like a great kind of a handbook even 
both for those who are already familiar with depth of union psychologies, as well as for those who probably are new to it and would like to know more about it. It, it also sounds, it occurs to me that it, it kind of co-wrote itself. You know, it sounds like it was a very synchronistic kind of co-authoring of itself, the way that it came to you to actually make it into a book and the fact that you had already written some pieces of it. And, and then, of course, you had to orchestrate it by putting it together in the right way so that it would flow. But it's, yeah, it's a yeah. fascinating story about how that happened. Well, it seems to me, Karen, that you're in a pretty unique position as the chair of the Union Archetypal Studies Program there at Pacifica. I wonder if we can kind of maybe end this where we started, and that is we started with your journey through discovering Jung and Union studies. Now you are the person who is offering that opportunity to students to learn about Jungian theory and archetypal studies and learnings. So I'm wondering how you've seen your own students over the past couple of years begin to benefit from the studies and the things that they're learning in the Jungian and archetypal studies program there. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great question. And um, I see students, obviously, at both ends of the process when they first apply to the program. And then when they move, having done coursework, into dissertation writing and, and finally graduate. So it's great to see the transformation and the maturation that takes place from that beginning to the end point. I think it's fairly common for students to be drawn to Pacifica generally and uh, the Jungian and Octopus Studies program specifically with a kind of deep calling to come to the program, but often not with a precise understanding of what it is they're called to do. I mean, the nature of vocation and calling is that sometimes we only know the, the next step. And so students sense that the next step is to come to Pacifica, and they have these aspects of Jungian psychology that really speak to them and stir them in a deep way. But what is great to be in the program as faculty and as chair is to see how the students from a very tentative beginning when they're trying to feel their way into the complexity of the field of depth psychology, to move from that tentative first stage to a position of maturity and competence and authority when the student is writing about their chosen topic in their dissertation. I mean, that's part of the arc, the, the journey of graduate study, is that you assimilate the knowledge in the field and then you make that your own and then you, you step into your own authority. So all the faculty in the program are trying to cultivate that in the students to elicit critical thinking so that Jungian psychology is not merely accepted as a dogma or as a, an unchallenged truth, but that students can bring their creative and critical insights into engagement with ideas in the field. So I think for me that is one of the most satisfying and rewarding aspects of being chair of the program, to feel that I'm playing a part in that process, that I'm able to help students find their own truth, to guide them on this academic journey, which is, of course, is not only academic, but is invariably a transformative journey for the students too. So it's great to be involved in an academic environment where personal transformation is affirmed and recognized as something that is inevitably going to occur. So there's not that same division that you might get in some academic establishments between the cerebral theoretical study and the lived reality of one's life. At Pacifica, as you know, the two go hand in hand. So, so it's great to see the students on that journey. Uh, it's great to see some of the research that's being done by students when they get to their dissertations. There's such a great diversity of research projects from theoretical comparisons of young with other thinkers to very practical applications of depth psychological ideas to the study of culture and the study of psychopathology and the arts and sport and so forth. It's really a fascinating range of topics that are being treated by our students in their dissertation writing. Mm. Yeah, that's very exciting to hear. It gets me really excited to think about being able to dig into and have access to all those kinds of things. And of course, the aspect of personal transformation is not a small one. I just have to say that for myself, too, having seen that from the inside. You know, there's kind of an inside joke, actually, among a lot of students there. You probably heard it yourself, Kieran, but some people are referring to Pacifica as kind of the Hogwarts of uh, yeah, schools yeah. because we, we get to really go there. That relates to what you were saying um, earlier about the, the magical element uh, in these ideas. It's not the magic of Harry Potter, but still it, moving into these fields brings us into a more, ideally, into a more en enchanted way of being in the world and therefore counters yeah. the disenchantment of the modern world view. And it you know, brings us into contact, as I said earlier, with the numinous, that, that kind of spiritual power and the, and the mystery that comes through, that shines through the psyche in so many ways. So uh, absolutely.
Yeah, it definitely does that for sure. Well, thank you so much, Karen. I've been speaking with Karen LeGrice, who is a professor of depth psychology and the chair of the Union and Archetypal Studies Program at Pacifica Graduate Institute. And of course, you can get Karen's newest book, Archetypal Reflections, Insights and Ideas from Union Psychology, uh, either at the Pacifica Bookstore in person in Santa Barbara, California, or online at www.pacificabookstore.com. And, of course, you can also find that at Amazon. And then you can find out more about Kieran online. Actually, I just Googled your name, Kieran, and your website came up. There's a lot of information, in fact, some videos of interviews and things with you there that people can check out. And you're also on LinkedIn if people would like to follow you there, Kieran Le, which is spelled L-E, Grice, G-R-I-C-E. And you're so knowledgeable, Kieran. It's clear that you really are passionate about what you do and about helping to extend depth psychology in the world. And so I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing. And thank you again so much for spending some time with me today. Well, thank you, Bonnie. It's been a a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. You've been listening to Discussions in Depth Psychology, powered by Pacifica Graduate Institute with host Bonnie Bright. 